It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. Yeah, I've got it, I've got it. Behind the wheel of a classic car. <laughs> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Oh. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. Doubled up there. There'll be worthy winners. £1,700. Yay! And valiant losers. Also! <laughs> Will it be the high road to glory? Loving it, loving it, loving it. Or the slow road to disaster. <laughs> this is the Antiques Road Trip. <laughs> what fun. Heidi, hi, campers. It's the second leg of our road trip and we're back on the winding country lanes of Kent. <laughs> With dealer from Derby, Irita Marriott, and affable antiqueur, James Braxton. I'm taking you for a ride. <laughs> Better strap in. Irita's behind the wheel of a four-cylinder 1968 Volvo 1800S. I've got to tell you this. You might want to remove oh, that. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> He's always had a good nose for a bargain and can sniff out a moneymaker anywhere. If I could get this for 30 or 40 quid, I can see a profit in it. But Arita's no slouch either, and she's not afraid to buy what she likes. Spare teeth, anyone? If it has a tenner in it, I will buy no. it. You're all over it. I'm all over it like a rash, <laughs> like a bad rash. <laughs> well, Irita practically came out in hives last time, then. She made a profit on all her lots at auction and has £301.84 in her pocket. But it was James who won the day, almost tripling his money. He has £586.30 in his piggy. That's the largest profit I've ever made on a single item. I kind of feel privileged that <laughs> I got to enjoy that moment with yeah. you. I'm just going to buy bigger things, aren't I? I've got to. Yeah. Heavier. Exactly. Heavier. Now you can buy yeah. as heavy as you like. I know. The Braxton weight test is going to come in for some rigorous testing. James, for the first time ever, you can use Braxton weight test on your pockets. I know. <laughs> Full, yeah. they're dangling to yeah. the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, with money burning a hole in their pockets, our curio chasing couple are on a tour along England's south coast, starting in Kent then into Hampshire, and a final showdown in Devon. Is this road going to get any narrower? Um, I hope not. Because <laughs> <laughs> I want to get to that shop in one piece. You're a lady on a mission, aren't you? I am lady on a mission, that's for sure. That mission kicks off today in Appledore. Lying on the edge of the Romney Marsh, famed for its wide-open plains and breed of eponymous sheep. Literally looks oh, no. like he was just born. He can barely stand up. Oh, sort of giddy, aren't they? And in two shakes of a lamb's tail, we're at our first shop, Station Antiques. Come on, Arita. Are you ready for this? I was born ready, James. Come on. Housed in an original railway goods shed and minded by the very capable Val today, these guys have antiques galore. Well, what's this very strange headless fellow up here? It's stuffed uh, cotton. It's, it's, it's like a mannequin, isn't it? Like a shop mannequin with the head there. And these are in a sitting position. What a very strange item, isn't it? Beautifully made, beautifully stitched. But it looks very odd there. And at £30, it's not <laughs> a lot of money. But um, I can't see it making 100 now, don't lose your head, James. What's Irita spotted here? They are just fantastic. A collector's cabinet is one of those things that if you collect coins or medals or anything small and flat, even jewellery, one of these would come in so handy. You've got a little flip on the front with a key so you can keep it all safe. Then you've got little tiny drawers with sections so you can put all your goodies in. And at £175, it's not expensive at all. I like that. I like it, but not to buy to sell. And that is the aim of the game. Now, how's James getting on? Here's a good-looking lady. Now, what is this? It feels always the Braxton weight test. 
nice and heavy. So if it's nice and heavy, three things it can be. It can be a resin, uh, it can be marble, or it can be alabaster. She's had a knock, and that's come off there, but it's not really an integral part of the piece. Um, the head's lovely, the nose is intact. This is sort of decorative statuary that would have been in a house. And what sort of period? This would have been the big housing boom, sort of late 19th century, early 20th century. I would think country of origin, though, would be France. The lovely thing about making so much money in the first leg is instead of looking at costume necklaces for a fiver, I'm now looking at what they're hung from at 120 pounds. Really lovely. Oh, I tell you what, money gives you opportunities. That's one for the mix. Look at that. I just love the look of it. It, it is so stylish. I'm trying to see whether there's any marks, but I can't spot any. But it's definitely German, the Jugendstil kind of style, in the manner of um, the Art Nouveau 1900, with all these flowing flowers and lilies, and it's just so of its era. I mean, what is there not to love? Well, just depends on the price. £95, yeah, well, that's not to love, really, is it? Hmm. If that has some movement, I've got to come home with me. That's one each. Has James found any other contenders? These are quite nice. We've got a pair of tables. What I like about these is uh, it's metal, but it's not bare metal. You've got these open trellis decoration, which is rather nice. Just simple wire, but it's got a very attractive pattern. Um, to say it was Art Deco, I think would be pushing it but it has a real 30s, 50s glamorous feel about it. it th these look as though they should be beside a Hollywood pool or a Miami pool with sun lounger and long, long wired telephone resting there. Yeah, take me there now, I need a holiday. 24 pounds each, I think they're rather nice. Time to start spending that wad of cash, James, eh? Val. Hello, James. Hello. Now, I've had great fun, and I've found two items yeah. I'd like to buy. Well, in fact, three, in fact, but one's a pair of tables. Yeah. They're £24 each. I'm happy to give you £48 right, for the yeah, two. Right, yeah, they're worth that. But there's a rather nice bust. Would, would 80 buy it? I don't think I can on that, but I would take 90 if that's OK. Sold, sold. Yeah. Definitely take Thank that. Thank you, James. I'll buy it at 90. Lovely. Here are, pal. Thank you very much. Just peeling it off now. One, two. Three. There we are, Val. Thank you, Aunt Thank you so much. That's a combined total of £138, leaving James with £448.30. Bye. Bye bye now. Meanwhile, has Irita managed to find anything else? It is a little tin watercolour box. For whatever reason, somebody's written on it, T, 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 T. Nothing to do with the T at all. Because it has little watercolours inside. And it even still has colour and the little tiny, tiny porcelain dividers for the colours. This would date from early 1900s, 1910. It would have had a little mixing pot in there. There would have also been porcelain and then a little tray and this is where you would put your brushes. You would be surprised how collectible paint boxes are. I just really like it. I know it's battered and I know it's got parts missing. But it got so much charm. This is so worth £5.50. It's a bargain. I'm gonna go and see Val. Val, I'm coming bearing goodies. Fantastic, that's what we like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> that's well, so I've... sweet, isn't it? It is adorable. Yeah. And for £5.50? Yeah, it's very cute. But you yeah. can have the odd 50p off to tidy the number up. Oh, thank you. I didn't expect that. That's OK. So that's around fiver. Yeah. And this has a ticket of 95. OK. I would think they'd probably be happy with 75 for that, if okay. that helps you. Yeah, definitely helps yeah. me. Right, so I owe you around 80. Wonderful, thank you very right. much indeed. Let me put that there. 
best part getting paid. Yeah. We like money. <laughs> Who does it? Let's hope I can make some money. Good. I'll pop the money there. Thank you. And thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. See bye you bye. later. Bye. That leaves Irito with £221.84 in her war chest. Lead on, driver. Let's get out of here. Meanwhile, James is down the coastline in Great Stone. He's here to find out how these mysterious concrete monoliths once defended our shores from attack. He's meeting local historian Peter Osborne to learn more. Hello, Peter. Hello, what, James. What, what an incredible sight. It looks like some sort of mad art installation. It does indeed. They are sound mirrors and they were designed nearly 100 years ago to uh, track incoming aircraft. Was this to, something to do with the Blitz or something in the Second World War? No, much earlier than the Blitz. It was a reaction to the bombing that had taken place in the First World War. During the Great War, the Germans developed a new weapon which brought terror from the skies, the Zeppelin. And in 1915, they unleashed it on Great Yarmouth and Lowestoft in the first ever air raid on the British mainland. This put civilians in the firing line for the very first time and meant Britain could no longer rely on the channel to keep the enemy at bay. As tensions across Europe escalated in the 20s and 30s, the British government needed to develop a new line of defence to protect the country from attack. So they get bigger as you get closer, don't they, Peter? Yes, indeed. They're quite impressive structures. What is the diameter of this? This one's 30 feet, that one's 20 feet, and the wall you can see over there is 200 feet. Wow. And how do these structures work? Like that. They are. Just like cupping your ears. Exactly the point. And the mirror itself collects the, the noise. There was a listening device on the end, a collector on the end of that arm. OK. And as the arm is moved around from inside the control room, they would move it around to find the loudest signal and that would give them a direction and an altitude. The brainchild of physicist Percy Rothwell, who designed and built the sound mirrors, they were the cutting edge of military hardware. However, many at the time were unconvinced, calling the mirrors Rothwell's folly. Despite the ridicule, a series of these acoustic structures were built around the country and they were incredibly effective, able to give a 15-minute warning of approaching aircraft. So it's quite an impressive structure, Peter, isn't it? It is indeed. So how does this one work, then? Well, this is essentially the same as one of the standard sound mirrors, except this is a slice down the middle. If, if you imagine a series of 20-foot mirrors, they're all lined up side by side and they all reflect to a point on the forecourt. And then add a series of tucker microphones all the way down the curve of the mirror so that you could tell if the sound was concentrating there, you knew that it was coming from over there. If it's concentrating on that microphone over there, then it's coming yeah, from yeah, over yeah. there. And picking up low frequency sound was good because it travels further. So this is where they were getting the 25, 30 mile pickup of aircraft over the channel. So this is early detection and then, then you sort of put down your cup of tea and you think, oi, oi, boys, we're <laughs> on call here. Amazingly, the technology still functions as it was intended today. So if you take your position at that end of the wall, right. I'll walk off to the other end okay. of the wall and you see if you can hear me. Right, will do. Hello, James, can you hear me? Clear as a bell, isn't it? It does work really clearly, really clever. Always think of objects absorbing. But it does sound. sound as though the voice is coming out of the wall. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. It was the advent of radar in 1935 which led to the sound mirror technology becoming obsolete. 
and the project was shut down. However, the hard work of Percy Rothwell was not in vain. He went on to gain prominence for his work on missile guiding systems. Despite the mirrors themselves never seeing action, the techniques developed by the sound mirror operators for linking stations and plotting aircraft movements was passed on to the early radar team, contributing to their success in World War II. Peter, thank you. It's been really interesting, and I'll look at concrete structures with re renewed interest. Certainly watch my P's and Q's when I'm near them. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Peter. Thanks, a pleasure. Uh, is that the rumbling of a Zeppelin or the purr of a Volvo 1800S? This car is just so classy. I'm loving it. Loving it, loving it, loving it. She's crossed the border into East Sussex on her way to Hastings. Her next stop is the Hastings Antiques Warehouse, where dealer Clive has amassed a treasure trove of delights. £221.84 pence left, remember? I like the look of these. You can see wine labels in every antique shop going. What you usually see, though, is you see whiskey, gin. One th label that I have never seen before is this. I'm really sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but tell us, it's a Portuguese wine. And it comes with two others. It comes with Madeira and Sherry. They are only silver plated. They're not solid silver or anything. No precious metal. But aren't they cute? Originally, wine labels were made to go on the neck of the decanter because the decanter does not have any labels on it. So you wouldn't know by looking at it what was inside. For 45 pounds for three, it's just no money. I've got to have these. That's one. Anything else caught your eye? Gold tick, French tick. Got a whole pile of French brass door plates. So these, if you have a nice big manor house and you do not want to get your doors dirty by pushing them with your fingers, you put these above the handle and you push against them. And it's nice to see that there's a whole set so somebody could literally kit out the whole entire house with these. Now. What is the price on these? £100 for all 13. Do you think the 13 is going to be a lucky number for me this time or not? I think I'm just going to ask Clive about these and see what he can do. Clive? Yes? Brace yourself, Clive. Can we talk about these, please? Of course we can. A set of 13, £100. Where could they possibly be? If I said £75. Well, if you say £75, then I ask the next question. You've got three labels in the cabinet yeah. and they're priced at £45. Best is 30 quid. That's now £105. Yes. Round it down to 100 Go on in, go on in. Can't say no. Thank you very much. All right. I'll have that, that's a deal. Excellent. Let me give you some dosh. That leaves her with £121.84 in the kitty. Time to collect James and call it a day. These two are dog tired. I don't know what dog I'd be. Whether it's small or large. I, I don't, don't really know the breeds, but for whatever reason, um, some sort of a spaniel comes in mind. Spaniels are lovely, aren't they? If I had to choose a dog for you, well, what you'd be, you'd be obviously tall, elegant. It'd either be a red setter or an Afghan hound. Ooh. Oh, Ooh, very posh. And on that note, mighty night. It's day two of our road trip. We're on James Braxton's home turf in East Sussex this morning. That's one of these chalk horses. That is all Friston Church, the Cathedral of the Downs. So this is where my friend Richard lives. <laughs> it's so pretty. Isn't that pretty? Oh, do you 
you take me to best places, James? That's why we call it a road trip. <laughs> Yesterday, I, Rita, went on a shopping spree and bought four items. An Art Nouveau brass dish, a 19th century tin paint box, a set of three silver-plated decanter labels, and 13 gilded brass French door finger plates. Gold tick. French tick. Meanwhile, Moneybags Braxton purchased a 19th century marble bust and a pair of 1950s Florida tables. He's looking though they should be beside a Hollywood pool. But his wallet is still bulging with 448 pounds and 30 pence. It's lovely having money, Irita. I bet it is. Just peeling it, it off. Peeling it off. <laughs> Our antique hunting pair are on their way down to Eastbourne today, officially one of the sunniest towns in the UK. The sun's got his hat on today, too. After dropping Irita off, James has driven on to the Eastbourne Antique Centre. Whoops, overshot it there. <laughs> it's a bit better. He has an appointment with Paul and his trusty pug. Hello. 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 <laughs> Introduction's over. Down to business. He's not hanging about. Straight to it. So we've got a big print here, and this is uh, for a very well-known artist, William Russell Flint, and it looks like lots of activity, lots of people. Where could that possibly be? I'd say Egypt. It looks like the Nile, really. And it's quite nicely framed, framed as the period. That's a very typical uh, 1960s frame. I think that's the original print in its original frame. It's rather nice. Paul? Yes. What price could this be? Uh, the Russell Flint, that can be £50, Joes. I like that. Um, I'll g certainly give you £50 for it, but i still got money burning in my pocket, you'll be pleased to know. Have you got, have you got anything in the bag? Anything in the bag? Yeah. Have you got a storeroom? Yes, I have. Follow me. Thank you. Oi, oi. Thank you. What's he up to now? Well, as you can see, there's not a huge amount of stuff in here, but there are a few bits and pieces. I like the chair, Paul. The chairs are interesting. Uh, I've made my mind up where that chair comes from. We've got a Bentwood seat there, haven't we? The great Bentwood maker was um, Thonet, wasn't it? Yes. They were Austrian, and they did all those incredible cafe chairs. Didn't they? They, oh, they did. That went very all nice. over Europe. Even rocking chairs. And um, rocking chairs. Yes, Bentwood stuff. was one of those incredible inventions, rather like rattan. Rattan's a natural thing, but bentwood was incredible. You can make these incredible shapes. I think this is probably beach by the look of it. Yes. So, and it's just a really nice shape. You've got a circular seat and you've got a nice um, curved back. You look very comfortable in that one, actually. I'm feeling very comfortable in it. <laughs> but it's nice, you've got a lot going. How much, what have you got on that? I can do that for you, James, for 30 pounds. Paul, I like the chair. I'll give you 30. Thank you. And the picture. That's 30 for that, 50 for that. What's that? Around 80. It is indeed, yes. There you go. Thank you very much indeed. I'll leave it on the side there. And I'll take the chair with me. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great fun. Pleasure. That leaves him with £368.30. pence, And on he motors. Further west, Irita has travelled five miles away to Beachy Head. Towering 162 metres above sea level, for hundreds of years the chalk headland has been a prominent landmark for sailors. However, all too often, the cliffs and the rocky seas below were a danger to vessels, leading to wrecked ships and lost lives. Irita has come to talk to writer and speaker Rob Wassell. Rob, what a location! Isn't it stunning? It is absolutely breathtaking. It is indeed. This is the Beltoot Lighthouse. They started building in 1832 and they completed construction in 1834 and it helped warn um, ships and mariners of the dangers of these shores. Believe it or not, there's thousands and thousands of shipwrecks that litter the coast and the reason being is because there are very dangerous reefs around here with saw-like projections um, that can rip through a ship's hull. When did they figure out that there was actually a need for the lighthouse? When did they take the action to build one? 
over generations and hundreds of years, more and more ships were getting wrecked as the shipping lane got busier in the channel. And that's when people began to get increasingly more concerned of the, the loss of life and also the loss of the ships and the cargo, which were obviously really expensive. It was the wreck of the East Indiaman, the Thames, which garnered national attention when it ran aground in 1828, and that spurred local MP John Fuller into funding the Bell Touts construction. So on this spot, in 1828, they constructed the first lighthouse made out of wood, and it was so successful, they decided to build a permanent lighthouse on this spot. Operational for 70 years, the lighthouse helped to save countless sailors' lives. However, it wasn't perfect. Sea fog gathering at the top of the cliff would regularly obscure the light, making ships vulnerable once more. So, in 1900, work began on building another lighthouse at the base of the cliffs, the Beachy Head Lighthouse, and the Bell Toot was decommissioned, flashing its light for the final time in September 1902. And in 1903, Bell Toot was sold into private ownership. The lighthouse changed ownership quite a few times, and after that, the Roberts family moved in. As soon as they moved in, they knew they would need to do something because of its close proximity to the cliff edge. The average rate of erosion is around 60 centimetres a year. Originally, when they built the lighthouse, there was um, a sufficient amount of land in front of it. But over time, that area was diminished. And um, as a lighthouse or close to the edge, that's when they knew it was going to be really dangerous. One fateful night, they were in bed and they heard this rumble like thunder and they knew exactly what had happened. And so in the dead of night, they collected their clothes and bits and pieces together and they went to stay with family in Eastbourne. And it wasn't until the next day that they came back that they saw that 15 metres of cliff had just gone in one go. What, right in front of it? Yeah, massive, massive cliff fall. In 1998, the lighthouse was just four metres from the cliff edge and a 61 metre fall to the rocks below. The only way to save the Grade 2 building from tumbling into the sea was to move it, a major engineering challenge. Over the course of three days, engineers moved the structure 17 metres inland to its new location. So when they lifted the lighthouse up and moved it back into position, it was 850 tonnes of lighthouse they moved. And amazingly, it was so successful that even the plates and the covers didn't move and were unbroken. No way. They moved 850 tonnes without smashing a single plate. Indeed. And that just shows how precise the whole operation was. Nowadays, the lighthouse is a luxury B&B, &B, and it certainly gives a whole new meaning to a room with a view. Ah. What a view. Isn't this amazing? Ah, there's nothing like the fresh sea air. But James has left it behind, turning inland and making his way to Polgate for his last stop of the day. Summer's Antiques, managed by Richard. Oh, hello, Richard. Hello, James. How are you? Yeah, very good. Very good. Good to see you again. Thank you. Where should I be looking? You can look anywhere you like, James. Everything's for sale and good. there's no price on anything. So if you like it, just make me an offer. Perfect. Music, right. music to me ears, Richard. Yeah, I'll have a rootle, thanks. You're welcome. That's right, get stuck in. I've always liked these. These are known as harvest jugs. We've got a graduated set of three here. Um, they could come in fives. Um, and you, you always think with jugs that they are smaller than they actually are. That one is not a half pint, that's a pint measure. That's the quart, and that's the two-quart measure. And they were known as harvest jugs because when people were harvesting, we have to think back to a different age, there was no combine harvesters. People were doing it with size, and they were taking their wheat and their barley with size, and you couldn't, you couldn't do that all day. So everybody would stop for lunch. The farmer would have brought something out on the cart, and it was generally cider or beer because give people a bit of energy, a bit of sugar. They're very nice, but I don't think they're for me. I'll, I'll have to keep looking. Yeah. Sorting the wheat from the chaff, eh, James? Elsewhere, Irita has arrived in Helsham and her final shop, antiques and all sorts, owned by... Now, turn off your devices at home. Alexa! £121, 84 pence to spend, remember? 
like the look of this. Now you see snuff boxes all over the place. They come in silver, silver plate, novelty. This is what I would refer to as trench art and it is just handcrafted. Simply made, possibly by a man, sat in trenches. I love the little mechanism that it has. It has a little button-like thing on the bottom and a compass in the middle. So once you press that down and turn the compass the other way, it locks itself. So only the person who made it would have known which way the arrow needs to point to know how to unlock it. And I think that's quite cute. It's charming. It's, it's a bit different from the norm. And to be fair, priced at £50 isn't a lot of money for what it is. Maybe that compass will guide me to the profits. Oh, that's even better. Alexa. Mm -hmm. Hello. I've seen this little treasure. Is there magic that could be done to that? Because you love it, you have it for 25. <gasps> what? 25 pounds? Yep. This can be 25. I'm putting that down. I'm giving you cash. I'm getting in my pockets. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. I'm getting that. I'm putting it in my pocket before you change your mind and I'm going to carry on browsing. That's a generous discount. I wonder if James is having any luck over in Polgate. Ah, this is Richard's garden department. We've got lots of reconstituted stone, we've got statuary, we've got urns, but what draws my eye is the material. And this humble black painted urn here, this is rather nice, it's got a rather nice moulding around the edge, egg and dart moulding, and I suspect it's metal. And the metal it would be, would be most likely to be cast iron. So I'll just get in and feel it. I can see some nice brown iron oxides, as we, use, as we call it, rust. We've got a bit of compost in here, some rare plants. What's the actual body looking like? Not to damage anything. Yeah, it's a nice body. All seems very sound. That's nice. Richard, you've got a black painted urn in the front here. Yes. Would you come and have a look at it? Yeah, the compost is very, is very expensive. I bet it is. But don't <laughs> worry, I'll leave you with the compost, OK? What could that be? Um, 125. 125? Yeah. How about 80? 90. 90, you've got yourself a deal. And with that, he's done. £308 spent overall, leaving himself £278.30 in the bank. He'll have to pop back for that urn later. Meanwhile, Irita's still shopping. Look at you. Oh, I like you. Oh, isn't he adorable? A little brass. Paper holder. This is what I would refer to as a gentleman's antique. And it would have sat on a desk and you open your letters and you put your paper in there and pop that down. So it keeps it all nice and neat and tidy and they can't blow away. So basically it is a giant paper clip. It is missing its glass eyes and it is 45 pounds. Alexa, I quite like your little froggy. He's lovely. You haven't got his eyes by any chance, have you? We haven't, unfortunately. Oh, what a shame. Um, he's priced at 45. What could you possibly do on the little froggy? The eyeless froggy. The eyeless froggy. Um, 37. Round it up. 35. I'll buy him. Let me give you some cash. Here we go. That's 35 pounds for you right there. Wish me good luck. Good luck. <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye. Those final two purchases cost a combined £60. Time to link up with Mr Braxton and the Volvo. I, I just kind of feel like a passenger in all this. I'm, Why? I'm just here for the journey, for the laugh. Irita, you've got to start playing the game. I, whoa, whoa, whoa. Playing the James, game. you never told me you're playing the game. <laughs> you said you were here just for the ride. <laughs> Time, I think, for some shut-eye. 
It's auction day. After taking in the sea air on a jaunt down the Kentish and East Sussex coastline, James and Irita have come to Stonewall Park in Chiddingstone Oath, Kent. Isn't it lovely? It is just amazing. Yeah. I'm expecting Jane Austen to come out any moment now. You look like the lord of the manor. Look yeah. at you. You suit the environment very well. Ah, meanwhile, their precious cargo has made its way north to Lincoln, where auctioneer Colin Young of Golding Young & Moore will wield the gavel with keen bidders online and on the phone. Well, that's cool then, hammers up, and I sell at £30. Irita spent £240 on her six lots. I wonder if Colin fancies anything in particular. Uh, the finger plates are a nice little group there and uh, all in good condition and that's a real positive. Um, I suppose it's the thing that does anybody really want to be polishing them, particularly with all those nooks and crannies? I think that may be where it's limited. James splurged £308 on five lots. Does Colin see a hidden sleeper here? The bust is a lovely item, but the key to this type of thing for decoration is the purity and the damage that's on it is a great impurity and I think that's going to cause a problem. What do you think is your winning item? One item? None. A rubbish. <laughs> what well, about you? Well, um, I'm hoping a print. I put a lovely print, William Russell for mm. him. Let's hope it did well. Shall we see? Go on then. First under the hammer, Irita's Toad Paperclip. £20. 22, 25, <laughs> 28. Go, Colin! 30 now, Go 30 on. bid, 32. 35 now to a seat. Oh, I'm broken even. Well done. 40, I'll, I'll 40, 40 you're away. 42 now to a seat. 40 <laughs> pounds. The profit. 42, 5 to a seat now, then 45. 48, 48 bid, 50. 50 what? Bid, oh, 50. Seat, he broke 50! And then selling at 50 pounds. Not a bad start to proceedings. Toad did well. <laughs> did do very well, didn't it? Good profit. Can James's Austrian chair make the bidders sit up? 15 bid, 18 bid. 20 bid. Oh, 10, here we go. 25, 28. Keep on going. You're nearly there, James. 28. I, I thought it might. Ah, oh, 30. 32. I thought it would make around there. 35 now, then. 35, 38, 40 now, 42. 45 at 45 pounds. All done then, going then at 45 pounds. Even Stephen so far. Oh, well done. Go on. Irita's brass snuff box next. 20 pounds, everybody. 20 pounds is bid. At 20, 20 looking for two now then. At 20 pounds a bid. 20 looking for two now then. 22. Surely a bit more. 25 now then. 28 there on my right. 28, bid me 30. 30. 32. 35, 38 now, 38, 40 pounds bid, two now to a seat, 42, 42. Hammers up then, once, twice, third and final time then. Making a good margin of profit so far. Moving on. Well, well done. Well, that, that was worth buying. Hoping some poolside bidders are watching from Miami next. 20 bid, 22, 25, 28, 28 bid, oh, 30, let's 30, start. 30 bid, 32, 35, 38, bid 40 and 2, 45. 48, bid 50, 5 now, 55, 60. There must be somebody with a pool. Somebody has a pool. Two people have a pool. Two people. 55. 55. The bid's on the right then at 55, but a bit of order, and then hammers up, then done. Finish for the pair of tables, going at 55 pounds. In profit, but only just. We just recycled them, haven't we? We're recycling everything that could be going in the skip. Yeah. yeah. So a new home to be loved again. Yeah. Yeah. 13 unlucky for some. Irita's brass finger plates are up. 40, 40 pound a bit at 42, 42, 45, 48, 48. Oh, we've got some ground to cover here. 75, 75, 85, 90 now. 85, 95. That sounds like the internet. Big leap, doesn't it? 40 now. What? 50 over here to the right. What? So exciting. Double money. 180. This is so good. 220 now to a seat. 220 now to a seat. 220 bid. 240 now then. 240. No! 240 bid, looking for 50 now then, 240 bid, 50 and on now then at 250. Any more now then, hammers up then, selling at 240. Excellent stuff. A tidy profit there. Those must be the most expensive finger plates I've ever seen. They're good, aren't they? I can't believe it. Well done, well done, well done. 
the Sir William Russell Flint. Next. Thirty pounds, thirty five, forty, forty pound a bid. Looking for two now. Fly away. Two for anybody else then. Forty pound a bid. Selling at forty. And it's our first loss of the day. Oh dear. No. Normally they would make quite a lot of money, but there we are. I read this to cantilabels. What can these do? I wonder. Ten pounds. <gasps> There's some work to be done. 15 at the sale room, do a seat, but you were beaten to it. 18 bid at 20 bid. Two now, do a seat at 20 pound a bid. Really good looking lot. I think that's the end of that one. We're finished. We're selling this time at 20 pounds. Oh dear, another loss. Hey, how you win some, you lose some. You do. Will James's next item go bust too? At 80. 85. 80's in. You got it. Yeah. 10, 20. 30, 40, 150, 160. Come on. 170. Oh, Come on. I will sell it then. Hammers up at 170. A return to form for James. Good. I'm, I'm really pleased, pleased especially yeah. after the print not doing so great. Yeah. Okay, don't bring it up. Oh, so, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Hoping her painter's tin isn't tin pot, it's under the hammer next. We're already at 12, 15, 12, 15. 18, 18. We're now hey. 20 over here on the right. 20 bid. Look at the two now then. At 22. At 22. Last call then. Hammer's up. We're done. We're finished and selling at 22 pounds. Not bad for a five-pound punt. That's a good profit, isn't Oh, it? yeah. The cast iron urn is up. 50 bid, five. 55. 65. Ooh, 70. James. Five now, then. 70 bid, 75. Do I see 75 at a bid? 75, 80 now, then. Halfway where we should be. 75 at a bid, 80, 80 bid. High expectations of this. 80, looking five now, then. 85, 90. 90 bid. So I'm on, my, I'm on the money. You on your money. 95 bid. Any more now? 100 do I see? 100 pound a bid, surely. It's last call then. Hammers up at 100 pounds. Are you sure? Sells at 100. 10 pound is nothing to sniff at today. Well, profit's a profit, James. It is. Don't, Don't grumble. Will Arita's final lot dish up a profit? 50 bid, 5 now do I see? 50. Well done. Bid, 5 now, then 50 pound a bid, 5 again now do I see? 50 pound a bid, 5 for anybody else, then 50 pound, maiden bid has it at 50 pounds, surely 5 now. Oh then 50, no! have another close look at it. At maiden 50 bid. bid, 5 for anybody else, then hammers up, we're done, we're finished. Maiden bid has it, we're done and going at 50. Ah, a happy bidder there. And we're all done for the day. Tell you what, I read to stick to the finger plates, OK? <laughs> That's the fella. That's what made the most money today. It did really well. Best profit the of mate. the day. Very good. Well done. Congratulations. Not quite as successful as his last outing. After sale room fees, James made a total of £336.20, filling his piggy to £614.50. While Arita has made up substantial ground on James after costs making over £100 profit and swelling her piggy to £409.52. It's just about searching, isn't it? Finding that treasure. Which is not as easy as it sounds. Let's hit the road.